Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate being here. I, um, I was hoping you had a big wooden pulpit that I could hide behind. <laughs> I tell people I'm going to have to change my profile picture on Facebook. I've gained a, a lot of weight. <laughs> God is good, is he not? Amen. Amen. Thank, you for, thank you for having me today. I, I give honor to my parents this morning. Both of my parents are with me this morning. I'm thankful for that. I give honor to the leadership of your church. I'm going to share my story with you today. I've come to give a testimony. We all have one. Did you know that? Did you know you have a testimony? Do you know how powerful your testimony is? Do you know how we overcome the devil? The Word of God says, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. That's how we overcome the enemy. That's how we overcome ourselves. God is so good today. I'm thankful for him. If we don't invest in our young people, if our church doesn't invest, if churches in general don't invest in young people, the church will die with the old people. You need to think about that. It is the next generation that's going to take us from where we are to where we're going. And what we teach our kids is so important. Train up a child, the Word says. Do you believe that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to get right to it. I was going to share this with you. I grew up in, um, I'm an apostolic Pentecostal. And let me tell you, I went to a, we went to private school. We went to a Baptist school. And you can only imagine the debates we had in Bible class. <laughs> I'm thankful for the Baptist people. Listen, God has done so much for me. I'm thankful for all religions that have opened their doors to me. God has allowed me to cross boundaries and cross religions and cross denominations. And you know what we all have in common? Love one another, the Bible says. I'm not here to change you today. I'm not here to change your denomination. I'm not here to change your beliefs. I've simply come to share what God has done in my life. I hope you can take something from it. I hope I'm a blessing to you today. Thank you, Jesus. I grew up in a small church, a whole lot smaller than this. And I wanna share with you just some things that um, occurred in my life when I was a child. We never, um, I never knew that Jesus loved me. My church taught what you can't do. They taught where you couldn't go, what you couldn't wear, how you couldn't act. We were so scared we were going to mess up. As little kids, we were so terrified we were going to mess up. And fear came into my life through church when I was a little boy. All I knew was what you couldn't do, what you couldn't wear, and where you couldn't go. I didn't know what I could do. I didn't know what, where I could go. I didn't, know that, I didn't know that Jesus really loved me. I just had so much fear in my life. It's a sad thing when I look back. This is why I tell you, invest in your children. Teach your children the love of God. Teach your children that Jesus loves them and teach your kids what, what you can do in Christ because they listen to every word that you say. They take home with them every word that you do, everything that you do. They watch you. We watched. I never knew Jesus loved me when I was little. I never knew it at all. Five years ago, I was wearing a dress and high heels and wigs. Five years ago. I was so deceived. And now look at me today. Five years is not a long time. I feel like I've only begun. I'm so thankful for my journey in Christ this morning. Let me tell you what I did. I left that church as soon as I could get out of there, like probably a lot of your kids maybe have. We've all done it. A lot of us have done it. Us rebellious ones have done it. 
And I left, and I thought, I'll never go back to that church. I don't want anything to do with those people. I didn't want anything to do with that religion. And as soon as I could get out of there, I left. A man that sat on our platform in that church began to do inappropriate things with me at church when I was a little boy. He would take me to the bathroom, and I'll spare you details, but through the years I endured sexual abuse by the hands of another man in my church. It was a terrible time in my life. And so I had fear from church, and I had fear from where I couldn't go and fear from what I couldn't do. And then a man began to do inappropriate things with me. And he said to me, if you tell, I'll kill you. If you tell, your daddy will kill you. And I was so scared growing up. I began to hate the church when I was little. Homosexuality came into my life when I was a little boy. The enemy planted a seed in me when I was a child. The Lord did not allow that seed to grow. Listen, Satan is planting seeds within your kids. Satan is out to kill, steal, and destroy. And he'll work within your children. He'll work within your life too. But he came to me as a child. And so homosexuality came to me as a little boy. I couldn't help what happened to me when I was a child. I couldn't help those things. But Satan whispered in my ear, you are born that way. He would water a seed that a grown man, the enemy, Satan protected a seed. You need to think about these things today. It's very important. And so when I got out of that church, I thought, I'll never go back. Look what they did to me. It's funny that one person can offend you in church. One person, and you'll blame everybody else. One person can do you wrong, and you'll blame the whole church. The enemy causes division through one One person can bring division to your church when everybody else really loves you, when everybody else really cares about you, when he cares the most and he loves the most. I left at 18. I want to tell you some things that happened in my life. I'm not here to jump on you. I'm not here to change you. I'm not here to gay bash. We all have friends. We all have family. Somebody has been there. Somebody knows who's been there. Somebody has a connection to that. But I'm here to tell you there is a way out. There is a way out of homosexuality. There is deliverance from that spirit today. And I found it through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. When I was 18 years old, I remember I made a conscious decision to go be with a man. I'll never forget that day. It's very important in my story. I couldn't help what happened to me as a little boy, but when I became a man, I went back to something that I knew. And I knew, I remember that day, that spirit came to me, and I knew I was going to go do it, and I knew I was going to go commit sin. The Lord recently showed me that I went back to a familiar spirit. It's very important today to pay attention to these things. If God has ever brought you out of drugs, if he's ever brought you out of alcoholism, If God has ever delivered you out of a bad relationship, be careful that you don't go back to something that you know. Be careful that you don't walk back to a familiar spirit because the enemy has come to trap you. And I remember that day, I went back to something that I knew as a little boy. And I came home and I got in the shower. I could not wash the sin that I had just committed off of me. I was trapped. I made a conscious decision to go sin, and it trapped me. You better guard your lives today, people. You better live for God with your whole heart. Do the best that you can. Do the right thing when you can, and if you mess up, go apologize. If you make a mistake, come to an altar and repent. Jesus loves you. He wants to forgive you. Don't fall into a trap like I did because it almost took me out of here, and I, and I fell into condemnation that day. I never forget it. My church taught that condemnation was conviction, but that's not true. Condemnation is not conviction. 
when you begin to feel condemned over things in your life. Where does condemnation come from? I want to share this with you. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. If you are feeling condemned today, who are you listening to? Do you feel condemned for things in your life? Jesus doesn't condemn you. He wants to change you. He wants to bring you closer to him. I ask you to question what you're feeling today and who's sending those feelings to you. It's important. It's powerful. Are we shunning who we should be loving? I ask you a serious question today. Are you shunning people because you don't understand people? Are you shunning people that you don't like when we are required to love those people? You, if you have the truth, if you live with Christ and you have the truth, wherever you go, what are you intimidated by? Why do you let lifestyles of this world intimidate you? You have what they need and you allow them to keep you silent. It shocks me today, every church that I go into, they feel defeated. And for what? You have the love of God and you have Jesus in your life and that's all that you need. Listen, he is going to overcome the enemy. And if you carry him within you, God commands you to go share with someone else. Are you afraid of rejection this morning? I don't even know why I'm getting on all this. It's not in my notes. My mother says, stick to the notes. <laughs> stick to the notes. So that's what I'm going to get back. But listen, you have what somebody needs. And you're scared to share it. What is wrong with us? God, help us. Help us to reach the lost, whatever the cost. At 18 years old, I started going to the gay bars. And let me tell you something. It's the most fun you'll ever have in your life. You can see it on TV. Now I see through the makeup and now I see through the glitter and now I see through all the nonsense and the rhetoric and now I see the ridiculousness of it. But it looks enticing and it is enticing and they're enticing you and they're enticing your children. But it's a trap. The enemy has come to kill, steal and destroy. He's come to trap you. And I'll never forget when I walked into a gay bar. Everybody's welcome at the gay bar. Everybody. Whatever you want to be, whatever you want to wear, however you want to live, whoever you think you are, you are welcome there. They welcome you with open arms, no matter how crazy it sounds. You are celebrated. You are lifted up. That's how the gay community does you. I wonder as a church, how much more should we be welcoming as a church, how much more should we say, listen, Jesus loves you, and this is where you need to come. Come and sit with me this Sunday. Come to my church. We'll help you. Christ will help you. We'll work through it together. Will you donate your time? Will you give of your time to someone? You can love somebody right out of their sin. If you have the love of God in your heart, you can love somebody right out of their sin. Most people do not want to put the time in or the rejection that comes with that. But it's the truth. God is so good. Is he not good to us? Do we not love him today? I'm so thankful for him. At 18, I walked into a gay bar and I went around the corner and I saw drag queens on the stage. Let me tell you something. It was a big stage. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people were there screaming and hollering and hooping. For these women that I thought were women on stage, I had never seen a drag queen before, never even heard of one, truthfully. We were so sheltered. And I walked into that gay bar and I looked at, at those drag queens and I thought, that's what I want to be. That's who I want to be. God will give you the desires of your heart. You better have your desires in a godly place. You better have your desires fixed on him because he may end up letting you be who you want to be. As I look back upon my life, 20 years ago, I fought for gay rights. I fought for liberalism, and I fought for all of the things that we're living in today. And now I'm living as a Christian in what I fought for 20 years ago. Talk about a different side of things. Talk about an eye-opener. Living in what you fought for, living wrong, 
And now God has allowed me to live in the things that I fought for. Fight for what's right today. Fight for the word of God. Stand on the word of God. Declare the word of God in your life. Declare the word of God over your friends and your family. Plant a seed. Plant a seed of goodness. It's important. I wanted to become a drag queen, and that's what I became. It's not going to get any better, folks. I'm an apostolic, and they're crazy and hoop and holler, and I'm the quietest one in the bunch. I don't know why God's using me. I don't know why. I'm real. I've been there. I've done a lot of things that I'm ashamed of. I don't walk in shame anymore. God took all the shame from me. But there's things in my life that I'm ashamed of. There's freedom. I walk in freedom today. There's freedom from things that have people bound. Whatever it is, there's so, much, there's so many things in our lives and we're all trapped or the devil knows how to get to us. And he knows what it's going to take to keep us trapped. And so he sends those things to us. And I walk in freedom today. God freed me one day. I'm thankful for that. I begin to wear clothes to the bar. I remember when I put a dress on. I'll never forget that day. I thought that was freedom. I remember when I began to put makeup on my face and eyeliner and, and I became exactly what you see on television. I have no drag pictures on my page and you've never seen me dressed in drag. Thankfully, hopefully they're all burned today. But if somebody were to find one, I'll post it on my page and say, look what Jesus did for me. Look what Christ did for me. He changed me from the inside out. But I'll never forget when I began to sit in the bathroom and, and begin to put makeup on my face and my friends would come over and we would, do, we would all do the same thing. And see, it starts with little things. We just allow something into our life and it'll get on us and we'll go home and think about it and we begin to meditate on it. We begin to allow things to happen to us. It starts at home and it starts small. And before long, we'll go out in public doing things that we never thought we would do. And I begin to wear women's clothes. And do you know, I never went to a bar dressed as a man. Nobody at a bar ever saw me as a man. They saw me as a woman. That's shameful things. That's a terrible thing. Never one time did I walk into a bar dressed as a man. I always went as a woman. They always called me by a woman's name. I'm going to share with you later in this testimony of the importance of a Christian. It was a Christian woman that reached me. It was somebody in the church that said, come with me to church. Let me love you. Let me introduce you to somebody that you don't know. You have the power and authority over the enemy. You have that power. God has given that to you. Declare those things over your friends and your family. I remember at 21 years old, they invited me to a camp meeting. We went to a camp meeting. I lived in Elizabethtown then. I lived right down the road from you, dressed as a woman. My story has come full circle today. I ran these roads to Radcliffe, to Fort Knox, to these bars, to these clubs, and now I stand here completely different. When I came through Radcliffe today, I thought, thank you, Jesus. I remember driving, we were driving up there, and I thought, I could just remember, I looked over to a bar we used to go to. I thought, thank you, Jesus, I don't go there anymore, and I don't do those things anymore. I'm so thankful for the love of God today. We went to a camp meeting. They said, come on, let's go to a camp meeting. My friend Ruth lived in E-Town, and she always wore wigs. She was an older lady. I wore Ruth's wigs, too. That day she didn't, I always tell people she didn't screw it to her, down to her head. You know how they tied them on back then. Ruth said, I'm not going to do that. I said, don't worry about that. We'll go sit in the back where all the backsliders sit. Nobody will know we're even there. And that's what we did. Ruth didn't tie her wig down, and we went to church. I share this part of my story because I want you to understand the power of prayer. Many people are looking for a magic pill. They look for a magic potion. They think I have all the answers. I don't. It is prayer. It is prayer that will move mountains. It is the faith of a mustard seed that will change your friend 
that will change your son or your daughter, your mom or your dad. I went to that church service. I had eyeliner on. We sat in the back. And there was a woman that got up in the very front of the church. I don't know how Baptists do, but in the Pentecostal church, when they get up and start walking down the aisle, they're usually coming for you. (laughs) And I sat back there, and my heart sank. And I thought, oh, Jesus, that woman's coming for me. And she kept walking, and there was probably, I don't know how many people were at that camp meeting. There was a lot of people there. And we had connecting chairs, and she began to kick chairs out of the way. She got to my row all the way in the back, and she kicked a chair. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And let me tell you something. She kicked every chair out of that row, and she kicked all of the chairs out from around me and Ruth. And she laid her hands on me, and she began to plead the blood of Jesus over my life. She began to claim me. She began to speak against the enemy. The devil has no power here. She spoke powerful things over my life. And let me tell you what I did. I didn't run out the back door. I held my head down to the floor and sobbed. I was so beat down with sin. She said, raise your hands. I could not raise my hands. And she prayed and she prayed and she prayed. She had me by the hair of the head. And she prayed over my life. I want to tell you today... I turned around and looked at Ruth somehow, and her wig went flying through the air. (laughs) When they got done with us at that Pentecostal church, we looked like we'd been hit by a semi. But let me tell you what happened. Her name was Sister Perry. She lives in Louisville, Kentucky. She prayed such a powerful prayer over my life. While I was in sin... She was not intimidated by me or the way I was dressed or how I looked. She prayed for me. And on my darkest days throughout my life, when I went through suicide attempts or drug overdoses, when I didn't think I was going to make it, when I didn't think I was going to live, I would say, Jesus, what about that prayer? What about that prayer, Sister Perry, prayed over my life? I remember I accidentally overdosed in the car one day. And I had both hands on the steering wheel, and I knew I was going to die. I said, God, what about that prayer that Sister Perry prayed? I clung to a prayer all of my life that somebody prayed over me. I want to tell you what prayer does. You may pray for somebody today, and prayer goes into your future. Prayer waits on you to catch up to it. That's how powerful prayer is. I had to go through the process to get up to a prayer that had been prayed over my life. If God ever lays it on your heart to go pray for somebody, get in your car, walk down the aisleway, go wherever you have to go and say, can I pray with you? Jesus has sent me today. I feel led to pray with you. Is it okay if I pray with you? Listen to me. That prayer might not be for right then. It might be for 20 years down the road. Your prayer that you pray today might not be for right now. It might be for all the way down the road in 10 years when they go through something and they're going to think back, what about that prayer? Pray for somebody today. It is prayer that changes things. That is the answer. I can go home now. (laughs) Now you know the secret. I carried those prayers with me all of my life. I opened a business when I was 25 years old. I don't want you to think that I've lived a bad life. I've been through through a lot. I lived a great life. I don't want to come across that I lived a terrible life. I lived a life with drugs. Everybody that I knew did drugs. The gay community is fueled with drug use recreational. Everybody parties. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's having a good time. That's the way it's presented. And I lived my life socially doing drugs. Here's the thing. We can socially drink. We can socially do drugs. But eventually it's going to get you. It is coming for you. I lived a great life socially with cocaine. 
But eventually, it got me. Eventually, I went from a social drug user to becoming a full-blown crackhead. I'll tell you how I got there. I opened a business in, I was 25 years old. I was very successful. I had a flower shop. I decorated, I was a decorator. Listen, God has changed my life and I'm still a florist. God has changed my life and I'm still a decorator. Isn't that amazing? Ain't that amazing? I'm not ashamed of what I do today. I opened my store and it I was successful for many, many years. And then one day my attorneys called and said, listen, you've got to file bankruptcy. If you don't, this is some certain things were going to happen to me. And he said, if you don't file bankruptcy, they're going to get you. You're going to be in a mess. I said, You're going to, and I said, no, I can't do that. I cannot do that. I want to tell you today, God is going to take you where he has to take you to get your attention. He's going to allow you to go through what you have to go through to change you. He's working it all out for your good. Whatever you're going through today, Jesus Christ is working your life out for the good. When it looks dark and grim, it is for the good. I said, no, I can't file bankruptcy. And they said, you have to. And I weighed heavily. It weighed so heavily upon my heart. And finally, I had to. I filed out. I felt so terrible doing people that way. Even though I lived in sin, even though I was what I was, I was still a good person. How many people say that? They're really a good person. Listen, I was a good person, not saved. I didn't have Christ in my life, but I was a good person. We can't stop with people just being good people. We have got to say, come this way. Come this way. Come with me. Being good is not going to get you to heaven. It doesn't matter how good you are. That's not what saves you. I had to file out. Remind me to finish that part of my story. I never do. My mom says, tell the ending. It destroyed me, filing bankruptcy. It crushed me. And I'll never forget one of my lesbian friends come to me the day I got out of bankruptcy court. She said, here, I want you to try this. And it was crack cocaine. Just try it, she said. Make you feel better. Make you forget what's happening. And so I tried it, and I hated it. And I tried it the next day, and I hated it. And I tried it the next day, and I hated it. And I hated it day after day after day. And I kept trying it. And then I was hooked. Me, a business owner. I was the first gay man in my town that was given a man of the year award. I worked very hard in my community. I worked very hard within the gay community. I tried my best. And here I was smoking crack. I had let myself down through business, and now I had really let myself down with drug use. The devil is trying to beat you down. He knows how to beat you down. He knows how to kick you when you're down. This is a story of hope. Don't, don't fret yet. And I went from social drug use to being a crackhead. Do you know within the community that I lived in, that's the lowest of the low. People that smoke crack, we made fun of. As if meth was better. That's a true story. I was on the bottom of the barrel. We thought we were better than everybody else, and yet here I found myself with, even within the drug world, on the very bottom, doing things I never thought I would do, being who I never thought I could become. I became who I didn't think I could. God knew what he was doing. God has his hand of protection of mercy upon my life. My family sent me away. When people are on drugs, they don't know what to do. Families don't know what to do. What do we do? They send you away. My mom denies this, but she didn't know what to do. And they would throw me in their car and say, you've got to get out of here. You've got to go get help. 
And I went to my sister's in Kansas City. But it was in Kansas City where Jesus changed my life. See, everything that I went through led me to where Christ could get to me, where I could receive him and understand who he was. I had to go through the process of Jesus, through all the bad, to find the good. Thank you, Jesus. So here's what happened to me. I had a $500 or $600 crack habit every day. It's the truth. I quickly lost everything I had. You'll go through money like that quick. I lost my home, lost my business, lost my cars. I lost it all. Everything that I had worked so hard for, I lost everything. Five and six hundred dollars a day. I would come home from Kansas City. Dope dealers would meet me at the county line. They'd have to send me back. And I'd go get clean. And I'd come back home. And I knew when I was coming back what I was coming back to. Dope dealers start calling right then. You change your crowd, you'll change your life. Do you know that? I'm thankful for these girls today that sang. God has placed godly influences in my life today. It's important. I came home one day and I went to Bowling Green to stay with my nephew. I was sitting on a couch. I had been sober for three days. A gay man. I was so deceived. I thought I was right. You know what I thought Jesus would say? Listen, look what that church did to you. This is what I really thought. Look what the church did to you. It's okay. You can come on in. You've been through so much. Just come on in. I was deceived. Your friends are deceived. Your family is deceived. They cannot help it. It's what they think. It's how I thought. But that's not the way it's going to be. The Word of God gives us instructions on how to make it to heaven. And if we don't follow the Word, we're not going to make it. All of the parades in the world will never change the Word of God. All of the marches in the world are never going to change what is written. I had to get honest with Jesus. I was sitting on the couch that day and the Lord spoke to my mind. This is what happened to me. 20 some years later, after a prayer had been prayed over my life. It might take 20, re 20 years to reach your family. What if it does? Are you going to quit praying? What if it takes 20 years for the prayers that you're praying today to reach those that you love? What are you going to do? I encourage you to keep praying. Keep seeking after Christ. I sat there that day. God spoke to my mind just like that. This is what happened to me. The Lord spoke to my mind and said, the devil cannot love. I almost heard it, but he spoke here. This is where Jesus works, and this is where the enemy works. The Lord works here, but so does the enemy. The Bible says, think on good things. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. It starts right here. The devil cannot love, and I said, what do you mean the devil cannot love? I said it out loud. What do you mean? And God began to give me a revelation. He just spoke to my mind, and it was like I was watching a movie of my life. And God began to take me back through instances and things that had happened to me and all, and all the things that I had been through. And he took me all the way back to sexual abuse in the church. And it stopped right there. And the Lord spoke to my mind and said, the devil cannot love because God is love. Everything that God is, the devil tries to imitate. Everything that God is, the devil tries to imitate. And I said, what do you mean? The Lord spoke to my mind and said, the devil is a liar. This is why I post it everywhere I go. The devil is a liar. He is lying to you. He is the father of lies. That means he invented lying. If you are being lied to, it is from the enemy. God will never lie to you. He will never lead you wrong. The word of God will never lie to you. It will never lead you wrong. Ever. I said, why is the devil a liar? I didn't even know who was speaking to me. 
God began to take me back through my life. Flip, 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 flip. God began to show me instances where I had been lied to by the enemy, where I had been mixed up and twisted up. And, and God took me all the way back to sexual abuse in the church where a, a grown man had lied to me about what love was, where he had lied to me and told me things were normal that weren't normal. And I said, why is the devil a liar? And the Lord said, because God cannot lie. It happened just like that on a couch. God met me where I was. I didn't come to church. I didn't go to an altar. I did nothing that day but sat on a couch. And this is why I share with people today, Jesus will meet you where you are. While I was yet a sinner, a gay man, dressing like a woman, drinking and drugging, when I did not want Jesus, when I did not want him, I didn't want him, when I did not want the church, when I didn't want Christian people, I hated Christian people, when I didn't want none of it, he came to me and gave me a revelation of who he was. He wanted me. Jesus wants you today. We follow our thoughts. I jumped off the couch. God delivered me right then. I didn't know what had completely happened to me. It was so strange and so crazy. And I jumped off the couch that day. And I had been in Kansas City with a lady named Sister Gleason. While I was a gay man, she said to me, I went to a church service in Kansas City. She came to the back row where I was. And through a short process of time, she said, listen, the Holy Ghost has sent me back here to you. She's a quiet, reserved woman. And she said, would you go have coffee with me? I ask every church that I go to, would any women in the church walk up to a 40-year-old man that you don't know and ask them out for coffee? How many would do it? How many here would do it? Not many. Thank you. Somebody like you changed my life. It was somebody just like you that changed my life. She came to me. I'm sure she cleared it with her husband, now that I look back. <laughs> I'm sure she cleared it with her husband first. She began to pour into my spirit. And we began to go have coffee. And Sister Gleason would say, we're not going to talk about church. I don't want to know anything about church. I just want to get to know you. And I thought, no, you don't. You don't want to know me. And we didn't talk about religion. We didn't talk about the Lord. And she became a friend to me. Somebody from the church began to take me out and invest time in me. And she became a friend to me. And I began to trust her. I began to really listen to her. And when she said, Let's, would you like to have a Bible study? And I said, no, not me. And I said, yes, I'll do a Bible study with you. She began to take me to Bible study every Wednesday night before church in the pastor's office. A gay man. I started going to this church for a Bible study. And I would say, what is wrong with you, Ben? What in the world is going on here? I wouldn't tell my friends. I didn't tell anybody. And she began to do a Bible study before church. And I would get up and walk out of the Bible study and go home and never go to church. I want to encourage you today, if you're investing time in people, if you're pouring into somebody and you're not getting the results you think you should be getting, I want to encourage you to keep investing in somebody. Keep pouring into somebody. And so I left and I went home and got strung out and God gave me that revelation of who he was that day. I didn't even call my mother. She was so close to the situation. I called Sister Gleason and I said, God has, God has given me a revelation. God instantly freed my mind. We're bound in our minds. Your friends are bound in their mind. It's not in their clothes. It's not in the crazy makeup. It's not in the, all the things that we do. It's right here. This is where we're bound. Jesus freed me right here. 
I ask every church this. Why do you want a drug addict to come to an altar and repent when they're bound? Because after God freed me, after God delivered me, then I was able to make a conscious decision to become a Christian. I couldn't do it beforehand. Why are you not praying for deliverance over your friends and family first? Because once they are delivered, then they can make a choice to become a Christian. And after God delivered me, then I was able to make a conscious decision to follow Christ. Then I had to go through the process. I repented. I want to share this with you, and I'm almost finished. I'll never get through all this. I'm long-winded. I'm sorry. If you knew me before, you would not believe me today, where I am today. This is so important. After God delivered me, I thought, oh, my goodness, everything I've lived for, everything I've worked for, everything I've advocated for, everything that I've done in my life is wrong. And listen, it's not an easy process saying, I'm sorry, I've messed up, I was wrong. But that's what I had to do. I was wrong. God, I was wrong. I've marched in parades and I've done everything that went against the Word of God. I've dressed every kind of way that goes against the Word of God. The Bible says men don't dress like women. It was the most natural, normal thing for me. But I was wrong. I had to repent. Let me tell you what I did. I repented. I couldn't apologize for everything I've ever done in my life. I said, God, I'll never go do what I know is wrong again. There's certain things that we all know within our own lives, right or wrong. We've all got things in our lives that we know is not right or, we, or that is right. And I said, God, I'll never do the things that I know is wrong again. Let me tell you something. He showed me homosexuality was wrong. He spoke so forcefully and sp- to my spirit that day. And I said, God, I don't know any other way to be. I've been gay all of my life. I don't know how else to be, but I'll never go back to it. Jesus, I'll never go back to that. And let me tell you something. It's been almost five years. Thank you, Jesus. I would like to share this with you. Water baptism changed my life the most. You are not just dunking people underwater. You are changing lives. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, everything that you've ever done in your life, every sin you have ever committed, God puts them in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. Think about this. I want you to really think about this. When you get baptized in Jesus' name, everything you've ever done, is gone. Jesus removes it from his mind. I'm standing here telling you a story that he don't even know about. That's how powerful baptism is. I'm telling you something that God don't even know what I'm telling you. He's looking down here going, what is he talking about? Go get baptized. Let me tell you something. I told God I I smoked cigarettes four packs a day for 25 years, and I wouldn't go get baptized. I told God, I said, I feel like smoking's wrong. I'm just speaking about me here. I felt so wrong about smoking. And I said, God, when I get baptized, I'll never smoke again. If you tell God you're going to do something, you better honor your word to him. Listen to me. You cannot say, God, I'm going to do that, and then don't go do it. You cannot say, God, I'm not going to do that, and then go do it, or however it you tell God you're going to do something, you better do it. If you tell him you're not going to do something, you better not go do it. He's going to hold you accountable. And I said, God, I'll quit smoking when I get baptized. And because of that, I wouldn't get baptized. (laughs) Because it was water baptism that changed me the most. More than anything in my life, water baptism changed my life the most. My mom came one day and she said, you're going to get baptized. We're going to the church right now. And I had a cigarette and I said, no, I'm not. And furthermore, I'm not going to the church. I said, I've got sins that won't go down that drain. I've committed sin that won't go down the drain. I said, we can go to the creek. 
And we got out there, and I said, what about the fish? I was afraid I was going to kill the fish. I've been a sinner. I've done everything you can possibly think of. And they dunked me in the water that day. And here's what everybody does. Everybody says you're going to feel better than you've ever felt in your life when you come out of the water. I caution to say that. I can't tell you you're going to feel better than you've ever felt when you get baptized. I cannot tell you that today. Because they baptized me in Jesus' name and I came out of the water. And I felt worse than I've ever felt in my life. Let me tell you why. I went down a gay man. Even after repentance, even going to church, I would say, God, I'm, I'm still... And when I came out of the water, I lost my identity in the water. I came up and I did not know who I was. I did not know who, who, who Ben Bland was anymore. Everything that I thought I had known and stood for and lived for had been washed off of me. And listen, the church just wanted shouts and hallelujahs and praise the Lord. And it didn't feel that way to me. And I wanted a cigarette right then. <laughs> right then. Let me tell you what I did. I went straight to my mother's house and slammed the bedroom door. I come out of the water and everybody's standing there looking at me like, what is wrong with him? The Lord showed me I was having spiritual warfare right then. I, I went into spiritual warfare right then. We can't tell people. Listen, I can't tell you. You'll feel good. But I can tell you it'll change you. It don't always feel good when Christ changes us. It really doesn't. And I went to the bedroom, and I locked myself in my mom's house, and I would not smoke. And the enemy said, smoke a cigarette. Smoke a cigarette. It would have been one cigarette that took me right back to a lifestyle that God had brought me out of. If I had picked up one cigarette, it would have taken me right back to where I came from. My mom brought food every day and set it down by the bedroom door, and I'd eat that food and throw it back out. And on the seventh day, walking the floors, ready to ram my head through a wall, Jesus Christ delivered me from cigarettes. He'll deliver you too. He will deliver you too. Shortly after God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, driving down the road, he is so good to us. Jesus is so good to us. I guess you're musicians if y'all want to come. I want to share two more, two more things with you. The Word of God says we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Listen to this. We are transformed right here. We are not transformed by mutilating our bodies. The enemy has told what trans really means. We are transformed here, not by cutting something off. The Word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The enemy has stolen everything that it, he tries to steal everything that Christ does in our lives. He makes a mockery of Jesus. He makes a mockery of us. I took, after Jesus turned my life around, I had nothing. I lost everything I ever had. I lost everything I ever worked for. And I want to tell you this. I started selling tomatoes. I went and bought some tomatoes. Scraped up enough money to buy a few tomatoes. Sold them just like that. I started selling so many tomatoes. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I would go, go buy tomatoes. And I started selling them for $6 a piece. They were so high. $6 a tomato. And I thought, God, I wasn't making a lot on them. And I thought, nobody will buy a $6 tomato. And let me tell you what happened. If you'll put God first in your life, if you will put him first, he will change your life. I started selling thousands of tomatoes. Every Monday, every Wednesday, and every Friday, the police come down to my little building and they say, Ben, what in the world? Traffic was backed up as far as you could see in every direction and down the side roads. And they said, we're going to have to come down here and direct traffic. And let me tell you what I did. 
If you've wronged somebody in the world, when you become a Christian, you'll go make it right. People told me, you've, you've become a Christian now. You don't have to go make things right. God has forgiven you. Just come on to church and forget what's the, leave the past behind. But when I became a Christian, I began to go make things right with people that I had wronged in the world. I started taking that tomato money, and I started paying a bankruptcy. I started handing $1,000 here, $5,000 here. And I started paying people back that I had wronged. And in nine months, selling $6 tomatoes, I paid an astronomical amount of money off. And I made right every wrong that I had ever done with somebody in the world. Jesus loves you today. He wants to change your life. Let me ask you this question and I'm done. If God takes it from you tomorrow, whatever it is, are you okay with it? If you're not okay with it, you have found an identity in it. If God takes something from you tomorrow, are you okay with it? If you're not, you have found an identity in it. If you have found an identity in something, it has become your idol. You look like what you worship. I want to encourage you today. If you want to know how to win gay people to the Lord, love gay people. If you want to win a drug addict to the Lord, love a drug addict. But are you going to go through and endure what you have to go through to win somebody to Christ? If you see a man walking down the street today wearing a dress, what are you going to do? I'll tell you what happened to me. I too once wore a dress. But one woman came to me and said, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about somebody that you might not know, somebody you don't understand. And she hugged my neck and she was a friend to me first. If you can't become a friend to somebody first, you'll never win them to Christ. If somebody doesn't trust you now, you'll never win them to Christ. I want to encourage you today. Find somebody that you wouldn't normally hug and hug them. Find somebody that you would never take to coffee and say, you want to go to coffee with me today? You know why we do those things? Do you know why we love? Because God is love. And if we want to be like Christ, we will love people. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate you. <laughs>